Well, thank you, and good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. ¿Qué tal? ¿Todo bien? That's all the Spanish I know. That's it. So I thought it would be useful to um, look back 10 years since we've been uh, having these conferences for 10 years, but also to look forward 10 years to what, what might education be like in 2030. Um, and what I want to do is to involve you as well, if I can, so this will have a, a degree of interaction. So I know you've been told to, to switch your phones off, but I'm going to ask you to switch them back on again. So if you could take out any device that you've got, phone, tablet, laptop, and you know the password, if you could type in your browser at the top there, that address, which is just p-o-l-l-e-v.com forward slash David Price 439. If you could just do that now, and uh, then I'll just explain what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions as we go through the session, but I'm also going to make some uh, guesses. There's, there's no such profession as futurologists. The best we can do is hazard a guess at what might happen. Um, but you guys are the people who are going to make this happen. So let's start with a question. Uh, and I need to get your responses, so type them in. By now, you should have got uh, that screen. OK, I would change standardized testing. That seems we've got a lot of response. Stuhl choice, class size, stop blaming students, rethink exams test predominance. There seems to be a common theme that's emerging here. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a moment, but I just want to talk a little bit about the, the changes that we've seen and the nature of change. So let's start with what I guess was one of the transformative inventions in nutrition in the 19th century, which was the ability to put food into tin cans. It's a guy called Nicolas Appé who did this because Napoleon, in the 19th century, wanted to be able to get his uh, troops well fed. He invented this in 1810, but the tin opener wasn't invented until 1858. What did we do for 48 years? Shoot them? I have no idea. If you take the pencil, which was invented in Borrowdale in Cumbria, uh, 1564, the first pencil was invented. The first pencil sharpener wasn't invented till 1828. There must have been a lot of blunt pencils around by that point. If we take this, this is Ken Robinson's famous TED talk, Bring on the Learning Revolution. This was 2010, so we're talking roughly 10 years ago. And in this talk, Ken predicted that there'd be a learning revolution. So what happened to it? Because from where I'm sitting, it doesn't feel much like a revolution. Does it feel like this to you? Do you feel like the ancient regime is on the point of collapse? Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you that it is going to happen. It's just going to take a little bit longer than I think Ken first talked about. But I believe it is as inevitable as the impeachment of Donald Trump. <laughs> we just have to be patient. I, I feel sorry for the Republicans. They've gone from Abraham Lincoln to Sarah Palin to Donald Trump. It's no wonder they don't believe in evolution. But we just have to be patient, just like um, Bill Gates recommended when he said, we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And just like we had to wait for the invention of the tin opener, and we had to wait for the invention of the pencil sharpener, we have to be a bit more patient about the learning revolution. But I believe that we are approaching a tipping point, and I want to talk about some of the reasons why. So in 2010, when Ken first talked about the learning revolution, the world was a very different place. Automation and artificial intelligence and robotics was kind of on the horizon, but we weren't really losing sleep about it. And then, in 2013, came the famous report from Oxford University, which predicted that automation was going to eliminate almost half of all the jobs that we currently have around the world. Now, since then, that estimate of 47% of jobs, and remember, we're talking about jobs that will completely replace humans, not humans working with technology. But since then, PricewaterhouseCooper have downgraded that estimate, 
Uh, this year, they produced a report that said it will differ in different parts of the world. In the US, the effects of automation will perhaps be greatest. It's around 38%, whereas in Japan, it'll be about 21% of all jobs that will be lost. But whichever figure you look at, that is a huge amount of jobs to be lost. And as we've seen in this country, we can ill afford to lose those jobs and with many other. And yes, I know that every technological revolution creates many jobs too. But the sad truth is that those new jobs that were created can be replaced by robots. And if you don't believe me, you've just got to look at the 50,000 Chinese workers at Foxconn who just this week were told these are workers who've been protesting about extreme conditions that they have to work in to produce the iPhone. They work for $5 a day, and they've just been told that in the next phase of evolution, 50,000 of them will not be needed. So the impact of automation is enormous, and we perhaps didn't fully understand it in 2010. In 2010, we experienced the worst economic recession for over 50 years. And I just think it would be useful to look back at the kind of language that we used then in 2010. There was a phrase that we didn't use much before 2010, which was called the jobless recovery. And this is what the jobless recovery looks like. In this graph, you can see the blue line uh, represents the rise in productivity from 1945, so the end of the Second World War. The red line indicates median family income. This is in the US, but it's pretty much the same uh, for other countries. And what you can see is they pretty much kept track with one another until about the 90s, which is when the impact of um, automation first started to kick in. So pro productivity has continued to rise, but real income has stayed the same. And that's been more or less the case for 20 years. But there was another phrase that we didn't hear much of in 2010, which was this phrase, underemployment. In case people aren't familiar with underemployment, it simply means people are not working the number of hours that they are available to work for, that they prefer to work, and in many cases that they're not doing the level of job that their degree prepared them for. So this is a graph for underemployment and unemployment. And what you can see, that grey bar down the middle is when the economic recession hit. So you could see that um, unemployment started to rise steeply, the blue line started to rise after 28 as the, as the economic recession kicked in. And then when the recovery started, around about 2012, unemployment has gradually fallen. But underemployment, the red line, has continued to rise, particularly in the case of graduates. So that's a real challenge for us. And that is because of another phrase that we didn't hear much of at that time, which is this thing called the gig economy. The gig economy is that people are basically going from contract to contract, but not getting full-time work. And they put together a portfolio of career in this way. And the gig economy is affecting our young people more than any other demographic. And it's at a time when we have the best educated generation ever. And people in Spain will tell you that, that when we had 50% youth unemployment here, it was at a time when we had more graduates than ever. So one of the unfortunate facts that we're going to have to face is that they, by 2030, there may well not be enough jobs to go around. Which is why we're talking about something else that we didn't talk about in 2010, which is the concept of a universal basic income. And we're seeing experiments around the world in universal basic income, one of the largest, it's in my country, it's in Scotland. And what we're seeing is that we've got generations of, of young people who through no fault of their own are unlikely to be in a position where they will have what we've, most of us have known, which is the experience of a full-time job which pays a full-time salary. And I believe passionately that these young people will need dignity and they'll need purpose and meaning in their lives. And we cannot afford to let them lose hope, which is why these experiments in universal basic income are really important. Because if we rethink the concept of work, then universal basic income could be a force for liberation and not compensation.
But we have to rethink what we mean by work and the connection between full-time work and salary. Um, a friend of mine, Valerie Hannan, has just written a book recently called Thrive, and she talks about how the purpose of education really is not to create GDP, to, gr to create growth, but to enable us to thrive. And she talks about thriving in four ways. Firstly, thriving as a planet. And as we know, the, our current young people are the ones who, in the words of Johan Rockström, are going to have to pay back the invoices that the world is sending. The second way of thriving is as a society. And what we're seeing here are some major challenges. So there are some deep divisions now which are being caused by wealth inequality, by culture, by religious differences, by racial differences. And that affects the remaining two areas where she describes we need to thrive, which is interpersonally, how we relate to one another, and intrapersonally, how we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem. But imagine if we took all of that cognitive surplus that we will have with our young people, supported by a universal basic income, and we applied it to solving some of the problems that you've already heard before I spoke this morning. So imagine how we could liberate those young people and how we could genuinely change the world. But this gives us all kinds of additional challenges. And I always do a thought experiment when I'm with educators, and I'd like you again to take out your devices and answer this question. It's just an experiment, but I think it may well be the reality. If you knew that, let's say, for example, a third of your students, through no fault of their own, may never experience a full-time job again, as we've known it, what would you teach them? What skills would you think were most important? So please give me your suggestions. Soft skills, yep. Humanism, problem solving, entrepreneurship, adaptability, technical skills, information literacy, cooperative learning. Wow, this is fantastic. Feels to me like that's a really engaging curriculum. But the question I always ask is, wouldn't you want to teach most of those anyway? And the chances are, many of you probably are. So there's one change that's going to be inevitable in 2030, which is the curriculum. So these 10 gentlemen you see here are the famous Committee of 10, who in the US in 1892 pretty much identified the subjects in the high school curriculum that we all know and largely still have right now. But it seems to me to be ridiculous to think that those 10 subjects in 2030 would be what we're asking young people to study. Particularly so, now that with big data and machine learning, we now have the potential for an individualized curriculum for each and every student, which is based around the need to stretch them, but to maximize their talents and their interests. This is possible now. But we are still, it seems to me, stuck in many countries with a 10-subject national curriculum, and the concept of a national curriculum in a globalized world seems to be a nonsense anyway. A few weeks ago, I was working in Barcelona, and they're setting up a new school there, and it's come exactly from the kind of tech entrepreneurs that we've heard about today. And what they are doing is working on the concept that there will be no set core curriculum, that they'll create an individualized curriculum because the technology makes that possible. And more and more schools are now starting to do the same. But curriculum won't be the only area that we see transformation. You've already seen this slide today. Pedagogy in 2030 also has to change, it seems to me. And here's where we get to a paradox. Because we're at a point where unemployment is falling, and yet we have never had so many unfilled vacancies. So what does that mean? Well, here's another graph which goes somewhere to explaining it. So we're seeing, if you look here, that we had the recession, and then as we've got into the recovery, the blue line is job openings. So there are more and more opportunities around the world for jobs, but the actual number of hires is the orange line, which isn't rising at the same rate. And that is what a skills gap looks like. 
Now, when you talk to employers, and I do a lot, I work with employers, they kind of talk about the skills that they feel that they're not getting. And you've heard about all these skills. Here's the latest version of the top 10 employability skills. And we haven't just been talking about this since 2010. We were talking about these skills in 1990. It's all the things that you would expect, the ability to cooperate, collaboration, critical thinking, problem solving, the so-called 21st century skills. But we've been talking about this for 30 years, and we're still not delivering it. Now, if you're an educator in this room, and you are delivering these skills, thank you. You're doing great work. But your next task is to persuade your colleagues that they need to do the same. Because I'm afraid to say that, according to research, there is some self-delusion which is going on in the tertiary sector. They did this research last year. They asked thousands of people around the world whether they thought young people were ready for the job market when they came to enter it. And what you see is when you ask employers, only about 42% think that they're ready. You ask young people, 45% think that they're ready for the job market. But when you ask the providers, people like ourselves, 72%, almost three quarters of us, think that our young people are job ready. But clearly, there's a mismatch there. And to me, this suggests a degree of complacency in higher education. And I say this with the greatest of respect for the people in, the, in this room. But it also, that complacency, I think, helps to explain higher education's response to the learning revolution that I believe has already happened. So three years ago, I wrote a book called Open, How We'll Work, Live and Learn in the Future. And the premise of the book essentially was that the technological revolution has made informal social learning more possible now than it's ever been. And that we, what, now that we've got more control over our learning, we won't give that back. And the challenge, I think, is that learning in the formal sector has to try to understand what are the motivations of people who are learning informally and how can we learn from that and incorporate it. And I looked at what I call the six do-its, the kind of, what are the imperatives? And they're things like there's an autonomy about learning socially. We can do things for ourselves. There's an immediacy. Anybody who's put a question out on Twitter and had a response within seconds knows exactly what I mean. There's a sense of immediacy about this learning. But there's also a sense of collegiality. We learn informally with friends. And there's also a sense of generosity about this. Now, I know that there are cyber bullies, that there's trolling taking place on social media, but I think they represent a well-reported minority. I think there is a greater unreported majority who basically want to do unto others as you'd have them do to yourselves. And there is a sense of playfulness about this. And the, the final one, which is probably the most significant aspect of informal learning, is that we do it for the world to see. There is a high visibility about this learning. And, and we may have qualms about our students putting their work out to get feedback from around the world, but it is a huge incentive for them. And we have to recognize that these are the kinds of motivations that our students have when they're not in formal learning. And I think we've got a real challenge to, to match that kind of the drive and the motivation. And we're starting to see examples of informal learning taken to scale now. I don't know if you're familiar with Redes de Tutoria, but it is a way of learning which is informal, it's collaborative, it's peer-to-peer -peer learning. Students are both tutors and students. There are now something like 9,000 of these schools in Mexico, and they're spreading throughout uh, South America and Southeast Asia. And that's not the only example. We're seeing the rise now of employer-led universities, which is suggesting that there's a frustration and a dissatisfaction with the kinds of pedagogy which is taking place. So what does this mean for how we see ourselves as educators? Well, let's go back to Dead Poets Society, because I think we have to change our model of learning away from this idea that Robin Williams created, which is the teacher at the center of things, I think we've got to change the model from that to a better metaphor, which is this, which is a dog taking itself for a walk. So I think we've got to think about how can we enable students to be self-determined and self-directed learners. But I want to finish with the transformation that I think is probably going to have the biggest impact of all, which is in assessment. 
And if we think about it, assessment is the thing that drives everything else. So that if we change the way that we assess our students, we will change the way that we teach them, and we will change what we teach them. It seems to me to be ridiculous that in many countries around the world, we try to summarize 12 years, or up, in some cases up to 18 years of learning, in a single number. In Australia, they've got the ATAR score. In the US, it's a grade point average. In the UK, it's A-level scores. And we reduce all of that learning to this crude single number or letter. I used to run a um, tertiary performing arts college in the UK. I was director of learning there. And I once remember interviewing a student who was about to graduate, and I said to her, so what do you think you've learned from your three years here? What, it, what is higher education given you? And she said, I got a B. And I thought, yeah, it's kind of funny, but I, I thought, that is so sad that you would think that that's it. And what we're starting to see now is that nobody is happy with the existing system. So we're starting to see some really radical movements now. A few weeks ago, I was over in the US, and I was talking with some people who are doing a thing called the Mastery Transcript Initiative. And this is a, a new model of summarizing students' learning. It looks at, this is a mock-up, it's still in development, it'll take another couple of years, um, but it, it involves eight performance areas. These are not subjects, and there are no grades. Students have either achieved mastery or they've not. There's no standardized testing, and it has to be put into a consistent transcript format that can be read in two minutes by a university admissions tutor or an employer. And this initiative is currently being led by some of the leading independent schools in the US and the Ivy League universities. And it's also spreading around the world. So whether it's this model or whether it's some other model, we will definitely see the end, I believe, of standardized testing by 2030. We have to, because nobody, no admissions tutors, employers, parents or students are happy with the existing system. So it seems to me that will have to change. Okay, a quick summary before I finish. I believe that what we're seeing now, and it's still in pockets around the world, but it is a growing movement, is pressure which is coming in three forms. There's professional pressure which is coming from employers. There's parental pressure where parents are refusing to put the kids through what they consider to be meaningless standardized tests. And sadly, there's personal pressure. We are seeing students with higher rates of self-harm, of anxiety and stress, and sadly, we're seeing suicide rates rise. So we're seeing those, that pressure coming from three areas. And the change which needs to happen is going to be in those three areas that I've talked about, in pedagogy, curriculum, and assessment. And how we bring about that change was recently put, I think, very simply in a book by a friend of mine called Grant Lickman, called Moving a Rock, when he talked about, we have to agree why, first of all. There has to be a case for change. We all have to agree on why education needs to change. And in some countries, I think they've done that. In Finland, in Scandinavia, in New Zealand, largely in the US now. But in other countries like mine in the UK, we are still arguing about the purpose of education. But assuming we've got past that, we get into the what. And again, I think there is a consensus which is emerging around what education needs to look like in 2030. And it is what could form under that broad umbrella of deeper learning. So it's more depth in the learning, it's more individualization, more personalization, less breadth, and less standardization. And that just leaves the, the how. How are we going to do this? Well, I believe we do this through every person in this room going back to your institutions and doing what you can to put in place the changes which need to happen. Remember, when we looked at that question earlier on, these were the kinds of things that you thought needed to, to change. No one is going to do this for us. We have to do this ourselves. And I believe it will change. Not all of this and not all at once. But the momentum is unstoppable, I believe. We're seeing campaign groups around the world who are calling for these kinds of changes. 
So if you only do one thing today, I'd like you to do this. I'm part of a, a campaign group in the UK, we call it Education Forward, but it's an international group, and there are many of this. There's um, Education Reimagined in the US. Each country has its own campaign group, I think. But what we've done is we've produced a book, uh, which is our argument for change and what uh, a forward-facing uh, education system would look like. And we've got a website. If, if you would like to show your support for it now, then by all means go on this URL. But I'll be outside later on, and I'm happy to talk you through it. Um, we've got a 10-point plan for change, but we need people to show their support for it. And I think every educator in this room has got to ask themselves three questions. The first one is, how can I lead the change that needs to happen and not watch it being done to me? Too often, I think, we externalize the responsibility for change. So I go and I give talks in schools and in colleges, and people say, oh, we'd love to do the kinds of things that you're talking about, but they won't let us. And I say, who are they? You know, and I know we've got senior leadership teams, and I know we've got governments, and they may not always make the right kinds of decisions, but we have much more autonomy and freedom than we like to give ourselves credit for. And you can either lead change, or you can have it done to you and I know which I prefer. Second question, if our students won't learn the way that we teach them, can we teach them the way that they learn? Can we be brave enough to change our practice, as John, who you're about to hear from in a minute, did 11 or so years ago, can we be brave enough to learn from the way our students learn informally and accommodate that into our practice? And then the third question, how can I equip young people to see opportunities before threats? Because people like me who talk about the future can only say what might happen. We make our own future. And I think what we have to look at is, yes, you could see automation as a threat, or you can see it as an opportunity to liberate us from the boring, meaningless work that many of us have had to do. You can see uh, nationalism as, as, a, as a threat and a danger, or you can see it as a way to re-engage students in politics and civic society. So I believe we need an education system that gives our young people the confidence, the capability, and the compassion to thrive in a complex and turbulent world. But we shouldn't fear the future. Instead, we should help our students forge it. Thank you very much for listening.